<laughs> okay. This form will come uh, to order. Pursuant to uh, committee rules, uh, we're, uh, we're joined by uh, Congressman Sam Farr, who all of you know better than you know me. Uh, and we will run under somewhat committee rules, but in fact will be less formal. So uh, Ambassador Nassif, I know you know how to be formal. Let's, we're going we're gonna to work on, on less formal. So we're going to ask all members of the panel to make very much short statements, avoid uh, your entire written statement, because then we're going to have a dialogue that, unlike Washington, is a little less scripted. We're not going to ask necessarily for five minutes. Uh, we'll go back and forth. Uh, uh, traditionally, I'll go first, but quite frankly, uh, Sam has a, a key role here in uh, the Salinas Valley. And uh, once we've concluded, or if staff uh, asked at any time, they may come in with their own questions. Uh, so we're not going to be handed questions forever to try to uh, ask as they were intended to be asked. In fact, the way we view it is that uh, staff came prepared. If they, uh, if they have questions that either they came with or that they come up with, we want to make sure we have that dialogue. You will not be sworn in. Uh, this will be unsworn testimony, although it is being recorded. So you're still making a statement to Congress, uh, but the usual, uh, uh, what, I, what I call the tobacco lineup, will not occur. If you'd like to rise and raise your hands and have that picture taken, we can, out of courtesy. No, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, and the gentleman says no. <laughs> Uh, that was, yeah. Yeah. Sam, not being a member of the committee, doesn't know one tradition yet, and that is, Sam, were you ever on oversight in the beginning? No. You went right on to the lesser committees, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, now I'm ranking in agriculture. As, as well you should be. Chair in waiting. Um, we do begin with a, a mission statement, and I, I will read that, and then I'll uh, yield to uh, the gentleman from here uh, for his statements. The Oversight Committee mission statement is, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. And with that, I'm going to yield first uh, to the gentleman from Carmel High for his opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming to Salinas, uh, the county seat of Monterey County. Uh, you know it well. Your wife went to high school with me, and uh, so did General Amos, who's the uh, Commandant of the Marine Corps. So we have... Uh, well, one, one of you did really well, <laughs> and then you and Kathy... <laughs> So I appreciate these oversight hearings because I think that's the way we bring government to the people and, and listen to people. I'd just like to say that one of the, you've got a very distinguished panel here of people that really know this business. You're sitting in the salad bowl capital of the world and it's more than just a name. It is $4 billion worth of productive agriculture. Uh, it is the kind of agriculture that has no kill step in most of it. You don't cook it. You don't cook lettuce, which is our, one of our major crops. Um, it's also a, 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 a very productive uh, valley and, and county. And as your unemployment rate uh, historical trends show that one of the highest seasons of unemployment is during the winter months from December through, um, through April. And, um, and that spike goes up every year. So that could uh, affect one relating to this high unemployment, sometimes reaching 20% in this county. I think it's 17% in January of this year. That uh, it, it has an effect. But I, there are a lot of issues here, and I appreciate it, and not uh, just the regulatory issues with EPA, but I think we also have some issues of trying to provide a stable workforce through immigration reform. Uh, 
and very interesting, and hopefully some of the speakers will talk to it, is that uh, they're very interested in, in creating some regulation across this country so that people will grow uh, fresh produce uh, in a practice that they call the leafy green marketing order, which is a industry created regulatory process uh, and they've uh, they're champions of it and hopefully we get some uh, national uh, regulation to support California's effort here but I appreciate you having the hearing in Salinas uh, the salad bowl cap of the world and you've got the the best and the brightest in the industry before you so thank you uh, thank you Sam uh, this is the sixth uh, hearing in a series uh, with actually a seventh going on in New York as we speak nationally unemployment is at nine percent and does not appear to be moving in any great uh, speed in either direction as Congressman Farr said unemployment here has gone from 12 to 17 percent and although some of it is seasonal not too long ago, the unemployment rate was dropping into the 4 and 5 percent here and only rising to the 7 or so percent. But we're not here to talk about unemployment per se. We're here to talk about impediments to job creation. At AmericanJobCreators.com, we've been collecting employers and concerned citizens like you, your stories of exactly what government has done or failed to do that has led to you're not being able to create jobs or create products and wealth that ultimately help others create jobs. In Washington, bureaucrats often score success based on number of jobs created. Now this works fine when you add another hundred or thousand people to EPA. It doesn't work so well when you have the Henry Ford model that ultimately if you can do better with less less because pesticides eliminate the loss of crops so that you can in fact get a better yield or better in some form of automation that might in fact reduce the amount of people allow for a better product delivered more competitively against the rest of the world and ultimately create wealth which will create high paying jobs as it is done in America for generations. We're here today to talk about and to hear about uh, and this you know when we call something a forum or a hearing we probably should once in a while say no it's a listening session and remind ourselves to quit talking and start listening. Today that will be most of the case. We will encourage succinct answers but full answers and if you have additional ideas that you want us to know, even if the question is not per se, to at, per se asked, we want you to give it. We want to go back, uh, Congressman Farr and myself and the committee, we want to go back with the kind of ammunition that is more important than the petty debates that go on in Washington. We can all debate about whether it was 34, uh, sorry, 38 billion that was cut or 350 million that was cut. One thing we know is the private sector has made tough decisions far greater than Washington has yet to make. When we look at $34.9 billion in agriculture, we're not looking at dollars. We're looking at American families who feed American families. America being able to feed itself is one of the three underpinnings of a great economy. You must be able to feed yourself, manufacture the core elements necessary, uh, and mine those items necessary to, uh, uh, to allow you to create wealth. Many countries have succeeded having only two out of the three. No country has ever succeeded by being, quote, a service economy. Accordingly, the committee is, in fact, most interested in those three underpinnings, mining, manufacturing, and agriculture. Yesterday we were in uh, uh, Santa Clara where the things we manufacture often cannot be touched, but they touch our lives. And for that, we're truly grateful for that series of hearings. But today, we're interested in talking to the people who historically, for generation after generation, have fed the highest quality uh, produce to Americans and today often find themselves unable to use the land that they have for so long uh, farmed. And with that, I'd like to recognize our panel of witnesses. Ambassador Tom Nassif is the president of the Western Growers Association. Mr. Jim Bogart is the president of the Grower Shippers Association of Central California. Mr. Rich Smith is the owner of Perseo. Paraiso. Paraiso. Okay, I've got Sam here to correct that one. Vineyards, a producer, obviously, of grapes for the wine industry. Mr. Norm Groot 
is the executive director of the Monterey Farm Bureau and a counterpart to our San Diego Farm Bureau. I know you, you get together pretty regularly. Uh, Mr. Mike Gerard is the president and CEO of Man Packing. And Mike Murray is pre what? Mark. Mark, I'm sorry. Put my glasses on, then it will all work better. Mark Murray is president of the California Strawberry Commission, a third generation grower, and actually from Southern California. So with that, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Nassif, you're first. I will make the disclosure that uh, Tom Nassif is, in fact, the deacon of my church, uh, but he's not here in that capacity today. Thank God. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Farr, members of the committee staff, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. <clears throat> this morning, I'd like to sh shine a light on the impact and consequences of lawsuits brought against the Environmental Protection Agency and other federal agencies <coughs> by environmental groups that are reaping taxpayer-funded attorney's fees and resulting in de facto rulemaking process that is harmful to farming and of questionable benefit to the environment. The system is broken and Congress can fix it. Many of these lawsuits never actually go to full trial. Many are never appealed by the federal government, and some of those that do receive an unfavorable ruling by a judge give interveners no choice but to sign the settlement agreement to ease the onerous and outrageous consequences of these settlements. Often when nonprofit environmental organizations sue the EPA and other governmental organizations such as the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Services for failure to comply with the Endangered Species Act, it isn't unusual for the federal government to settle the suit and avoid the full trial. As the EPA continues these practices and pays the associated attorney's fees which run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars per case, the legal questions associated with environmental laws, such as the Endangered Species Act, are never adequately examined and answered. And worse, the settlement agreements put in place have adverse economic consequences for agricultural businesses and jobs with no evidence of protecting endangered species. This is a defective way to make public policy, as EPA and the environmental groups that sue it often work out the details of these settlement agreements without the farmers and the agricultural industry at the table. To comply with the settlement agreements or injunctive orders from the court, the EPA and other agencies impose regulations without meaningful input from stakeholders, without considering the economic impact on the nation's farmers or workers, and with little regard to the intent of Congress when the law was passed. As multiple lawsuits are settled and the resulting biological opinions are issued from U.S. Fish and Wildlife or National Marine Fisheries Service, the process and schedule leave little time for engaged input by the impacted stakeholders. A top concern to agriculture in California and elsewhere is the increasing number and adverse impact of these lawsuits involving the Endangered Species Act. While this committee is familiar with the struggle between farmers and federal fish agencies in California for water, I'd like to make the committee aware that there's also an increasing negative impact on agriculture's use of crop protection tools such as pesticides. Please know that we are not seeking deregulation for pesticides, far from it. Farmers are incentivized to use the least amount of pesticides needed to produce a crop. Pesticides cost a lot of money. Overuse harms the land and its productivity. But all crops need pesticides, whether conventional or organic. Just as the human body needs medicine when it's attacked by harmful bacteria and viruses. Rather, this testimony seeks to shed light on a broken regulatory system, one that's been hijacked by the interest groups on one side in a manner that keeps the interest groups on the other side, agriculture, out of the process. This is fundamentally wrong and contrary to every tenet of a regulatory system. In these settlements, agencies are essentially putting in place restrictions or stipulations in a manner that replaces or overrides the transparent and public rulemaking process. This not only sidesteps the authority of Congress, it also results in environmental regulations that are often redundant, humanly impossible to meet, expensive, and of questionable benefit to either endangered species or the environment. It's an underhanded way of changing the rules on the nation's farmers that circumvents Congress and the stakeholders. Currently, the Center for Biological Diversity and the Pesticide Action Network North America are suing EPA 
because they say the agency is violating the Endangered Species Act when it registers pesticides under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. According to the more than 400-page court document detailing the complaint, the environmental organizations say EPA is failing to adequately consult with other agencies regarding the effect of nearly 400 EPA-registered pesticides on more than 200 endangered and threatened species nationwide. The court documents list over 27,400 different combinations of active ingredients and pesticides and species, each of which could require consultation. This case could cause severe economic harm and loss of jobs to tens of thousands of farmers and cripple their ability to grow America's source of food and fiber on more than 112 million acres of farmland across the country, not just in California. As this case heads towards potential settlement, we recognize that the process is leaving out the voices and rights of people and industries with a stake in the outcome, those who will be expected to devise and pay for remedies and mitigation of a situation which may or may not be able to be remedied. As the Obama administration has broadcast its commitment to accountability, this process should follow that edict and ensure that Section 1010 of the ESA amendments of 1988 be adhered to, which, quote, minimize the impact to persons engaged in agricultural food and fiber commodity production and other affected pesticide users and applicators, end quote. This committee can help facilitate this. We ask that this committee investigate this process and recommend corrective action or legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. That is one of the ongoing investigations. Uh, in addition to H.R. 1446, which we recently marked up, that uh, in fact will make these judgments more transparent. Mr. Bogart. And I apologize for your having to sort of pass back and forth the, the mics, but I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, thank you, Chairman Issa, Representative Farr. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. My name is Jim Bogart. I'm the President and General Counsel of the Grower Shipper Association of Central California. We're an agricultural trade association representing over 300 growers, shippers, packers, processors here on the central coast uh, of California, uh, specifically the counties of Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito, and Santa Clara. Uh, I'd like to focus probably the majority of my remarks um, on process. Uh, it, it, the, the process concerns me as, as much as specific regulations. As you know, California um, is the number one agriculture state as measured by gross receipts, and we grow over 400 different crops, and exports are a critical part of our industry. Being able to keep input costs down is critical to our business, as well as our ability to compete in global markets, particularly given the energy costs we are experiencing. One of the concerns I hear most from farmers and others in California agriculture relative to the EPA is that they really have a lack of understanding of the impact of their regulations on our industry. One of the greatest shortcomings of the EPA's regulatory approach, whether it be related to air, water, dust, etc., is a lack of thorough cost-benefit analysis during the development of regulations impacting agriculture. It is vitally important from a public policy perspective to have EPA thoroughly explain the costs as well as any potential benefits of their proposed regulatory actions before they take them. Therefore, I would urge this committee to require EPA to consult with the Office of the Chief Economist at USDA on any regulatory matter that will greatly impact agriculture and to allow all of us in the in industry an opportunity to comment on the analysis before any rule becomes final. I believe that a more clear, vigorous approach by EPA to conduct a cost-benefit analysis would be extremely helpful to averting regulatory activities that are overly burdensome or duplicative. In terms of EPA regulatory activity that many in the agriculture community see as burdensome and duplicative and which is particularly timely is the issue of National Pollution Discharge Elimination Systems, NPDES, permits. EPA is the 